Hey guys, this is Comic Uno, and today I'm doing Comic Uno's Best Comics of the Week, and this is the show where I review all the comics I've read this week in one show. We go least favorite to best pick of the week and everything in between. So before we get started, I do have a Kickstarter going on right now for Bi Visibility, a bisexual anthology, so, so hopefully you guys could go check that out. And of course, at the end of the video, we do the viewer's pick of the week, so stay tuned for that, and in the comments below, let me know your pick of the week. Now, jumping into this week's haul. I had a pretty small amount of books for my haul this week. I had nine books and number nine for me was The Amazing Spider-Man issue 73. Yes, I'm going to do a whole video on the Sins Past aspect of it, the One More Day aspect of it all, but what did I think of the overall issue? Uh, the artwork was solid enough. You know, I do think there are some funky uh, facial expressions, but overall it was solid artwork. The story really has to do with uh, my thoughts on retconning Sin's past. Great that we, you know, we're getting rid of that storyline, but did we need this? Again, what does this mean for One More Day? I will mention that in that video that I'll be posting either Thursday or Friday. That's the bigger question, and is this all just kind of a troll, and, and that's something I, or even baiting, uh, that's something I'm definitely worried about. So, I didn't quite love this issue. Overall, I'm giving that one and a half stars, and that is number nine. Moving on to number eight, a book I normally wouldn't get, but I am super excited for the newest volume of, of the main series, I will say, and that is Black Manta issue one. So the book I'm excited for is the Jackson Hyde Aquaman book. I've heard already great things about it. So I was like, let me read the book of, of his dad, you know, let's see if it's connected at all. And honestly, from what I can see, it's not very connected. It really is its own story. And if you guys don't know, I'm honestly not a huge Aquaman fan. I never really got into any of the series. I like the Future State stuff. Uh, there's stories here and there I like with Aquaman, but never really gotten in, gotten into an ongoing series. So, you know, Black Manta is not usually a character that's on my radar, and I don't feel like this made me a Black Manta fan. I think you've, if you've already enjoyed the character, it kind of tests the limits of, is he a well, we already know that he's a villain. Are they leaning more towards anti-hero realm with him? And that's kind of more of the question here. And honestly, it just didn't do it for me. The artwork was pretty good. I like the grittiness of it all, but the story itself didn't really garner enough for me to get an issue to. But it, it wasn't a bad story. It just, I don't think I was the audience for this one. So I am giving that two and a half stars, and that is number eight. Moving on to number seven which is Batman issue 112, the first part of Batman Fear State. I didn't quite love the alpha issue. I thought it was just okay. And once again, this issue one was just okay. The Batman family stuff was definitely the best aspect, but a lot of it was just filling us in from that alpha issue if you didn't read the alpha issue. And then the rest is Peacemaker or Peacekeeper. I always for forget their names and, and what they've been up to. And that seems like a bigger role than Scarecrow himself. We get Batman on the fear toxing a, a bit more stuff we've seen before there just isn't much progression besides the fierce uh, the future state stuff and I I don't quite care about that storyline and it's it's really um relying a lot on you enjoying that plot to enjoy this overall arc the artwork was pretty good for the most part the main leader Simon I think his name is I thought he kind of looked weird at times with some of the facial expressions he had uh, maybe he's supposed to look, you know, very grimy, but I, I didn't quite love his design here. So overall, I'm giving that two and a half stars, and that is number seven, I believe. Moving on to number six, which is a book actually was recommended for me, and that was The Me You Love in the Dark, uh, Mike Spire Slayer from Comic Book Corner 2.0. Uh, we do a podcast together. He recommended the book, said he thought I would like it. And honestly, it was a pretty interesting book. I, I don't know if it gave me enough to continue the series, but it definitely uh, had some interesting tidbits. So the first issue, we have this uh, artist who has, you know, artist block, we'll say, and art block, and moves into this haunted house. And she's like, okay, ghost, kind of help me draw. I, I need some inspiration. And then she meets a ghost. This issue kind of rushes things a bit where she seems like she falls in love with this ghost and uh, is helping her artwork as well and like seeing visions of him and or at least her own vision of him. And, and that's a big part of this uh, issue. The artwork was really good for this issue. I, I like the 
darkness and and, and kind of the slow moving terror terror of of this uh, series. So I enjoyed the visuals uh, definitely for this book. Again, I don't know if it gave me enough for issue three because I don't know if I like these characters, but I definitely like the scenarios that are going on. So overall, I gave that three stars, and that is number six. Moving on to number five, which is Daredevil issue 34. We are moving into the finale of this series, and that's moving us into this big event arc that's going to come out, I believe, December. And this issue really is about setting things up. I do think that it picks up a lot towards the end as Daredevil realizes he has to stop being sorry for himself because Bullseye is now out on the loose. And... Electra is also dealing with her own uh, moral compass of, do I kill this guy? I'm Daredevil now. What does it mean to be Daredevil? And there's definitely some interesting internal conversations there. Um, I do think it's a little slower, this issue, just because it's getting to the point of, okay, do we kill B Bullseye? What does this mean for the city? And Daredevil himself takes a little while to get to that decision. And I do think it's things that have already been discussed in this series. But I do feel like this is a, a good movement. This is a good spot to be in with Daredevil uh, and some interesting team ups as well with Mary uh, and and uh, Electra teaming up by the end of the issue. And the artwork is really solid for this book as well, uh, even though it's, it's kind of more of a talking heads issue. So overall, I'm giving that three stars and that is number five. Moving on to number four, a book I, you know, I honestly got because it was kind of a, a smaller week, and that is Dead Box issue one is from Vault. I, I never really had a Vault series on my pull list, and I definitely want to try out issue two, so we could maybe officially say a Vault uh, book is on my on my pull list. And you know, I'm a big fan of Mark Russell's work, especially his indie work. I I absolutely adore Second Coming. It's one of my favorite series on stands. I've enjoyed a lot of his work in the past, so. Um, I was definitely interested in this concept and what commentary we would have because it's obviously based on the red box, you know, renting DVDs. And in this version, it's like you, you create your own world and, and with this girl, she works at this convenience store that has the de dead box who is owned uh, by her father, the, the store, and, and her father's stick. And we, we get to see this world that she's watching on the dead box and her father kind of integrate uh, into one, you know, Fiction and reality is definitely blurring here. Now, I really enjoyed the present stuff. I enjoyed the the girl. I, I liked the story about her dad and even just the uh, surrounding story around this box. But the movie aspect was actually the thing I, I was kind of... Um, it was a little bit losing me, some of the dialogue. So that's why it's not as high up. But overall, it gave me enough to see where issue two is going to go, uh, especially where these characters are going to go. And the more... Um, commentary on how reality and fiction can bleed into each other and artwork was really good for this too very haunting uh but not too dark i i enjoyed that aspect of it as well so i'm giving that three and a half stars and that is number four moving on to number three which is mighty morphin power rangers issue 11 and i keep forgetting what the issue is because they also have a legacy numbering for this one uh but the character beats for this issue is really good it's still billy and matt dealing with the ramifications of betraying the power rangers as grace kind of has her own human uh motives of, of what she's doing and then we get a little bit more into the mythology of zordon which we've been seeing in both series and who do you trust you know Zord zordon is an alien do we trust him on earth you know to do the right thing and we we get a lot more characters in this too that are related to zordon to say okay there might be a war between aliens and Power Rangers making the war between villains a lot more interesting because Zed's kind of related into this as well. So overall, it, it's a good setup issue to some uh, definitely bigger storylines than we ever seen in the show. More sophisticated, I would say even uh, politically driven storylines within the Power Rangers mythos. So I think that's really cool uh, as well. Um, but the character moments is always what shines the most here. And, and that's the stuff I enjoyed the most in this issue was, you know, Kimberly talking to Matt and, and Billy trying to figure out if he's still friends with everybody after the betrayal. Uh, so there's definitely some interesting moments here. And our work is really solid for this book as well. So, uh, Overall, giving this three and a half stars, and that is number three. Moving on to number two, which is Crush and Lobo, issue four. And this is one of my favorite DC books on stands right now. It's just such a good character-driven series where Crush is stuck in prison and really stuck with her thoughts, you know, stuck with her daddy issues, stuck with her breakup. 
and really having to think about these things as she also tries to figure out a plan to get out of here and tell everybody I'm not Lobo. And Mariko does a great job at adding a lot of comedy into this issue while also dealing with a lot of character moments and a lot of um, interpersonal storylines here with still making it very interesting with the action and, and marrying that with the, the visuals. You know, it's not just her in a cell the whole entire time. Uh, there is some really good action in this issue as well. And overall, just a very solid issue that makes me very excited to see where the series is going to go and her relationship with Lobo in general. Um, and the artwork is really good and, and marries with that very well. So giving that four stars, and then it's number two. Moving on to number one, a book I normally don't get, but the annual very much uh, piqued my interest, and that is Green Lantern Annual Issue 1. When I saw Jessica Cruz on the cover, when I heard this is all about Jessica Cruz, I rushed to get this issue. Uh, and this really didn't disappoint. You know, we, we haven't seen Jessica... I think since Just League Odyssey, maybe it's, maybe we saw a little bit of her after that. But this is, you know, one of her bigger storylines since that series. And she is part of the Sinestra Corps, kind of by accident. Her ring stops working. She really only has this ring to travel. And she's like, okay, I'm going to use this ring to help people and survive. She has this conversation with Hal, which, you know, gets a little heated. It may be a little bit too much heated, but overall works for the story where Hal's like, oh, you know, you're wearing this ring, you've betrayed us. And she's like, no, I can utilize these powers for good. And Hal's like, okay, if, if you believe you could do that, let's see what happens. So yes, she's part of the Sinestro Corps, but no, she's not a villain. And I'm curious to see where that's going to go because out of every character who can do this, it's Jessica. She's overcome fear. Uh, she has switched on and off on different rings, starting out as Power Ring, then going into Green Lantern. And that's why she has such strong willpower is to control these other rings as well. So really interesting just one shot story. Now I'm not saying that this probably won't continue in, in the next series, but even if you don't read the, the series, which I personally don't read Green Lantern right now, uh, it just was a really nice one off issue to see exactly what Jessica's up to and showcase just how strong of a character she is and why she's such an interesting character. With some really good artwork as well, you know, seeing a new design with her with the Sinestro ring and, and some good action overall with hitting those emotional beats of, okay, who am I now that I have this? Sinestro ring and I'm not connected to who I once was and that's a really interesting story story all all on its own so overall giving that four stars and that's my pick of the week let me know in the comments below what was your pick of the week because of course we have the viewers pick of the week and from last week that was almost American and here are some comments about that Hopefully you guys enjoyed. This is Comic Uno. Definitely follow me on Twitter or Facebook. Go check out my comics like Father Like Daughter and They Call Her Dancer and our webtoon for free, Slice of Life. And also every Tuesday at 10 p.m. Eastern Time is our comic book podcast where we talk all things comic books on Comic Book Weekly. Thank you guys. Bye.